th you know, this region's known for um, these this owner builder culture and these fantastical, amazing homes that have been built by people, often handmade homes. But in particular, I think it was catalysed by the Aquarius Festival in 1973. There was a counterculture here before that, but um, what the Aquarius Festival did was it sort of lit the match that ignited the, the interest in this region for living differently, for um, thinking critically about mainstream culture and finding alternatives to that. The countercultural movement was um, exploration of alternative ways of living. And as part of that, uh, there was what was called the, the Back to the Land movement. You know, that countercultural reaction to bureaucratised, technocratic society that uh, the problems seen with that kind of society were that disempowerment of people. So building your own home, in a larger sense, becomes an empowering activity. I came here 30 years ago and it was a bit of a dream. I bought somebody else a share. They didn't actually have a site and I found this old logging track and so I thought, oh, this was wonderful. And I lived in a tent down, down the bottom. The road was atrocious. It was like four-wheel drive, there was no bridge. Um, when it rained. In fact, the first year I was here, I lived in a tent and it was called the Plastic Palace. And you had to leave the car on the other side of the creek and walk with a wheelbarrow up with your shopping and gum boots and stuff. So it was hard slog and it rained. It rained and it rained for the entire first year here. And I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> I just started having dreams about the house. So, and it was a recurrent dream, yeah. So I felt, uh, and I never wanted to build a tin shed to live in because I saw people, their sheds became their homes and this was going to be something special. So I actually drew it and then I wanted a round house, a totally round house. And then later it became an octagon. And I made, this was the precursor to the, the model that we made. And it was only when we built the model, because it's very hard to draw an eight-sided figure. So Pete built the model and then we lifted up with the model, we said, oh no, it can be three levels, the roof. With the model, I would, because it was an accurate scale thing, I could measure up uh, the length of the timber in the model for you know, these poles and rafters and whatnot, uh, and then go to the forest, cut the timber and bring it home, um, peel the bark, cut it to length, it up. Well, I'd built a house under a, a builder's license previous to this one, uh, and that was a, just a rectangular, pretty ordinary thing. But I had a textbook in one hand and a hammer in the other in those days. Um, it was back in 1979. 
Uh, by the time I came here, I was looking for something uh, a little more creative. I was 34, Joe was 29 at the time we met and started building this house. Um, so we were pretty enthusiastic and we had the energy to, to just seize on the dream and, and start creating it. Well, the world was different back then, I think. And we had no power tools. No power tools for the first two years. Um, we had a chainsaw. A chisel. Uh, chisels and hammers and uh, ham large hand augers which would bore the holes through for the, the bolts. Timber, so put the bolts in. So it was a pretty slow process. When we first met, I'd just started water divining. And I'd come here and I'd mapped out the layout of the underground water on this site. And I noticed that there are other energy lines running through this site as well, which I hadn't, didn't know what they were. And on investigation, I found out that they were song lines. And so we decided, well, the front door was going to go where the main line appeared to come in through the house. And we tried to keep our doors to open onto those lines so that you could walk through on those pathways. We have a lot of spiritual type of gatherings here. We might have a hundred people here for the winter solstice and we've had chanting and music nights and things like that as well. Mm. And other times we feel compelled to go away for a couple of months at a time uh, because the spirit beings need to use this place as well. It's as much theirs as it is ours. We wanted it to be creative, we wanted it to be different. We didn't want the mortgage hanging round our necks and we certainly didn't have a lot of money. I was working part time at Mount Wanning Preschool and bringing in the, a little bit of cash and we built as we could afford. It was a whole alternative scene back then. Everyone here were building their own houses. My conversations for five years with people were building conversations. Growing fruit trees. <laughs> yeah. salvaged timber from the forest that had already been cut down a previous generation. Um, and had that flitched up, like milled up into all the benches and tables and things. So we never cleared this area. It was already cleared. It was just a lantana patch. I actually started collecting windows and doors. Like, before we were up to that stage at all, now most people will go and buy doors and windows but because we had them, each of the walls was built to what we had and they're all recycled. Everyone is silky oak, beautiful bargains, all planed and sanded back to the natural timber. And I don't think an owner house is ever finished, you know. Um, is it, Pete? No, no I've still got a, a, Front doors. a pair of windows and the doors and a sunken bathroom. Yeah, the sunken bath. 
I live a very busy life. I have a high powered schedule teaching kids and classes and I'm out there and I'm politically involved with a lot of environmental campaigns and it brings me back to my sanity and my connection to the earth. I can remember going and visiting some, some of Pete's ex-TV friends the very early days and there were the white walls, the stark, the, um, she spent all of her time going shopping and I couldn't even imagine a life like that. It is so far from where, what gives me joy, what, what makes me tick. Um, I think that that's what's missing in so many people's lives, is that connection with nature. couldn't very easily do this, you couldn't experiment in this way if you were in the city or in the suburbs. Uh, it was a question of building regulations, uh, but also a, a question of cost as well. Yeah, people, you just couldn't afford it. And so there was this reaction against suburbia. The, one of the things that people talked about was that they no longer wanted to have that education get the career, get the marriage, have a mortgage, consume and die. You know, there was this thing about a reaction against that, that people wanted to live in a different way that was more present to the world around them. And, and so one of the answers of the, at that time was that country areas held, held that, held some key to, to working that out. What we seemed to need in a piece of land was that there was timber on it so that we could fire a wood-fired kiln. Other than that, it was whatever we could afford that had timber on it. And we were keen gardeners, so we needed some, uh, some vacant spots. And so all this land below us, down to the road, probably about two or three acres, was um, a banana plantation prior to it being lantana. Potters, I think, are very practical people, so we knew we could just do anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were into alternate culture, full stop, and it was the heyday in those times. Um, and it was just fabulous to be given this opportunity. The one disadvantage of building rock here was that because it was a banana plantation, all of the rocks had been bulldozed into the gullies, not very accessible. But what we arrived with was a Land Rover, and that did all the wonderful work. Yeah. First of all, I uh, built a little shack that uh, we thought it would only be for a very short time. And because this part here, where the house is, was the flattest bit of ground, although it's not very flat, it was the flattest piece of ground that faced north. And so we knew that this was where we were going to build the house. And uh, we were in the shack for quite a while when we had our second baby and then the nappies. Oh, just got sick of hand washing the nappies. So we thought we've got to get uh, 240 on, we've got to get electricity on. So we inquired about that and we were told you have to build some sort of structure uh, to hang your 240 onto. So we looked down here and we thought, right, Let's make a flat bit in the ground for a washing machine and we'll put a roof over it. And then when we did the flat bit of ground, put the washing machine, we thought, oh, but all that earth is going to fall in on the back of the washing machine. What to do? Right, let's go down the creek and get some rocks to hold the earth back. And that was the beginning of our rock work. <laughs> The 
house grew very organically. Yeah, we're artists, we're sculptors. <laughs> that was the priority. It wasn't the functions necessarily. In fact, we went without those windows. They're just holes, and just um, and then most of the timbers in this place, uh, the round timbers and the, those rafters up there, etc., were a result of windfalls. We never ever went out and deliberately milled a whole heap of timber. We just wait, waited until something fell down on our heads, and um, that was well. Yeah. Let's do something with that. A friend of ours came up from Sydney and broke all the glass on the way out, and he was going to dump it. But we thought, no, we'll just work with those shades. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? find the longest bits of wood we could and wonder now how can we put these together to create a space and a shape and a space. Yeah. Yeah. And working with rocks is such a delight. The idea of finding a positive to fit into a negative space compared with laying a brick after brick after brick, it's quite it's exciting. And when it's working well, you know, you're at one with the rock wall and it's a delight. But we go all the way to Grevillea to get, they made uh, floorboards of the, this wide and they're called hippie boards. <laughs> you know, nobody else would want that. <laughs> and we bring back um, trailer loads of that. So whatever came our way yes. um, was taken advantage of. The Dunoon tip was always yeah. really a treat. We'd find bits of OB2 and all sorts in the, in the Dunoon tip. And uh, listening out for um, people who had found some materials and that were access to the requirements. Yeah, sheets of excess glass from the Gold Coast, from high rise buildings, you know, all these big chicks. So, we, you know, we bought lots of them. And Yes, but, but very cheaply. One, I remember one day going down to the creek and seeing just a little flat bit of rock sticking out, out of the grass and we were always curious about we wanted flat rocks. And uh, then we realised it was really big. It was about, um, oh, about 800 by 800 by maybe uh, 200 deep. And uh, we started, found that it was that size. Then we came home for, for more bits of wood and soapy bits of wood to get it up. And it took us the whole day to get that rock from starting in the morning until finishing in the afternoon, bringing it here. And uh, I often think of, what would it have been like just looking down on these two people just in the creek with this massive big rock and thinking that that was the most important thing to do that day. <laughs> this is what I gave uh, Melina for, uh, as a balance for being a <laughs> Is that special? <laughs> And he thought I should hang it around my neck. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> a big gold chain. Right? So yeah, that's a good example of how <laughs> obsessed we are. <laughs> It was inspiring um, being in this community with all young families, with little children and living, mostly living in tents or little shacks and all at the same stage so that we, were, we rejoiced if someone got an extra few bits of uh, corrugated iron up or if somebody got a bit of floor. Or, 
And so there was just a real nice community um, feeling about that. And uh, we helped each other, we listened out for when uh, people needed us to go to workshop, not workshops, to work days at their places. And the same in return, that uh, people were very happy to come and give you a hand if you needed to raise some poles. This painting here is um, an abstract expressionist work from a famous now deceased artist. To my mind, if, we, if you want to see a plan for this building, that's it. It just, <laughs> it just has this sort of composition that's intriguing. Yes. Yeah. And uh, symbols in there, and you wonder, why did he choose that? Why would he have chosen that to go there? Yeah. And um, just, there, there is no end to it. It just goes out into the edges of the painting, and it could keep going. So we moved here in, in 77, and uh, ever since then, this has been a building site. <laughs> it, it's not finished yet. I just think it was um, the incredible talent that was here um, and the idea that we all collaborated and cooperated with each other to make sure that nobody was left out. It didn't matter where you, whether you're a professional, having quit and turned hippie or, or where you came from. Everybody was equal, and that was really appealing. So there was this kind of exploration of, of other ways of deploying architectural knowledge. There were also people who were up here, um, trained as architects, who were exploring um, you know, emerging concepts of sustainable and, and ecological design and developing them through building their own houses as well. Because of the, the number of communities that, that started to be developed here from the 70s onwards, um, as well as people who are interested in owner-built houses and design, uh, was that there was a, a critical mass of people who could share ideas and work together to formulate the new ways of building, of using alternative materials, of passive solar design, using water wheels or whatever it is that, that was going to help shape and, and configure a house. We've uh, chosen to remain autonomous. Uh, since for 33 years we've been off the grid. Uh, we've developed a solar voltaic systems, um, water management. There's 10 tanks, dams. So our major investments are in uh, water, energy, nutrient cycling, composting toilets, so we, we actually got a lot of information from lo local networking. So there's a big uh, group of people in this region coming from you know, the, the Northern Rivers area and we were for probably the furthest north of all of that group of people. But um, we, we network with other people about how do you do composting toilets, what kind of roofing will fit, how do you yeah. um, collect your water, what kind of uh, materials suit this climate. And that was a really big one for us, discovering that we should have put the roof up first because of the wet season. Here's the house being built. Here the next and this was banana. the next bananas, they have to clear it. Uh, the year before we bought it, it was logged and an awful mess and there was 50 acres of ex-banana, ground soil, noxious weeds, so it was a, we took on a huge task. This is in the five acre paddock where these logs came from. Here's us taking the bark off, and that's for building the second house. 
Well, the, the first was an octagon, and that was very much inspired by Samoan farleys, which are open and they're either round or oval. And the first house, the river house, was uh, an octagon. So it was the closest thing to a circle because we really felt like a circle brought people together and it had a centre pole. And we, inspired by Polynesia, we actually didn't close the house in, so it's still an open pavilion. With, back, with walls to... Large blinds on the north side and the massive stone walls to the south. And fireplace, Ingle and Nook. The river house has, has a big a stone walk-in fireplace, an Ingle Nook. Yeah. And above that, um, Irwin felt like Gaudi building a, a ferro-cement chimney. We found we needed to do another pavilion um, here in this house uh, in 1990 after being here 10 years because our children were becoming adolescents and the open uh, mezzanine sleeping study area wasn't suited to son and daughter adolescents and, mm -hmm. and uh, we needed to a studio office space to conduct our subtropic solar design and art so, partnership. So this house is also a sustainable house, has its own um, power and water systems and composting toilet. So with our, our background in architecture and interior design, we were able to bring those um, skills and understandings to this place. However, everything from then on was a process of discovery. It comes out of, as per the ethos of organic architecture, it comes out of the ground buttressed river stone and as it comes up mud brick downstairs and upstairs is much lighter uh, insulated um, timber with all the renewable systems mm. with a long east-west access. We're now in a uh, convertible northerly facing solar veranda. So uh, it's year-round comfort that's uh, totally passive. We, we uh, aim our architecture to be ecosystem services, positive and renewable energy, is, and passive solar is a part of that. We didn't, for instance, with the River House, have money to buy uh, flat timber for the ceiling. So a friend of us said, a friend of ours said, would we like to uh, thin his pine forest out? So you'll see that inside of the ceiling is a thousand pine saplings. <laughs> Radial pattern of, yeah. of uh, saplings. Yeah. And her name is Weber. And so we love octagons and we have used the theme of spider webs throughout <laughs> that and that also stands for networking with people. So we're interested in community networks and community and friends together. And we wanted a lot of uh, contact yeah. between the indoors and the outdoors. And most of our living actually happens on the verandas. Most of our meals are outside. So we like a, a yeah. good deal of connection and openings between, say, the kitchen and the veranda. And the garden. And, yeah, and the garden so and the food. So pavilions set in a yeah. garden food forest. Yeah. We started off um, doing everything by hand. No power tools, just all hand tools. And some, some hand tools were given to us for our wedding. So we actually arrived on site with lots of hose and augers and, and saws and things like that. And then at a, a certain point my mum 
gave us a generator, so then yeah. we were able to, to hurry speed up things up Adrian a bit. Was pregnant with our son, so, so we, we worked with the materials that we had, so that the the size of the house was somewhat um, along the lines of how long the poles were and um, the span of certain elements. And there was a book available at the time about um, dis uh, the span of certain timbers and so on, which were, was really helpful yeah. uh, about local Cold materials. Cold James, Sydney University It was again. put out by Sydney University, and it, it helped us understand um, the spans of um, different kinds of hardwood timbers that we found locally, how strong they were. And um, it was very much an adventure. We had drawings, but it was an adventure. How do you join two round elements together? If you've got two poles, uh, how do they meet, and how do you how do you detail that? Do it, uh, yeah, uh, joining materials elegantly. And we like to try and pass on those ideas to other people yeah. to save them a lot of grief. We test the experiments on ourselves and then apply them in uh, client solar house work. For instance, the Corumbanico village, we did a set of houses there um, that won some awards mm -hmm. based on our experiences here. We've got a, developed a theory that life is art, really. So it's kind of like um, building and living in a sculpture. And the fact that we um, have you know, now got clients who come to us rather than us having to be in big cities with an office mm. um, makes it feasible for us to be here and to put every second that we have into looking after the place and trying to get those ecosystems to look after themselves. You know, for some people it was about building a family home, but this individually shaped family home. And, and for others it was about actually building something that was quite different to a family home because they wanted to, to live in a different way. What people were, were coming up with was trying to find new social structures. And so there was this sense that society had to change in order to live sustainably. Building these unconventional places, unconventional dwellings, could also afford different kinds of living arrangements, different kinds of communal living arrangements. I bought the property without any knowledge that I was going to uh, be building a temple, but through building a house and getting that great joy of structure and art and form, practical art, then um, it was only when I realised that I had an opportunity to build again that I decided to build a temple because uh, I wasn't aligned with the family anymore but more with the universal family and that gave me uh, the opportunity to embark on this fantastic adventure. The design is in the Star of David, the two triangles perfectly aligned. And as we know, that's not really the Star of David, although King David in the Jewish tradition did choose it to represent the people, but he chose it because those two triangles represent the balance of the opposites, or the union of the opposites. So uh, to me, on this planet at the moment, I feel that there's some imbalance. So the concept of the temple is to restore the balance, to restore that healthy duality, and structurally, to work with triangles, uh, it was obviously going to be uh, a, a strong building. So the only plans that I used were the Star of David, and I put a pole on every point of that star, and one in the middle, one pole on north, with a six metre uh, radius, 12 metre diameter, 
And first of all, I had to dig 13 holes for the poles. Two metres deep, yay wide. That took a while. The poles were ready. And then I took the next full moon to uh, raise the poles. Because I like to do things on the full moon. And then discovered that that was a very auspicious full moon. It just happened to be full moon in Libra, which represents the balance, which I was trying to achieve out of this structure. It was uh, Easter Sunday, the resurrection of the Christ, or of love, and it was Jewish Passover on the same day, which is Moses leading the people to freedom from slavery. So I like to see that the auspiciously and without any intent, I happened to, the temple began on that very sacred day, uh, balance, uh, the resurrection of love and freedom. Then I went to India and came back six months later. When I came back, I began to build the first floor. And I did actually designed the building as I went up, which meant that as I put the floors in, I had plenty of time to think where I was going. And th although those floors were exposed to the weather for some eight or nine years before I finally got the roof on, uh, it worked out. So I actually designed it as I went, which of course, architecturally, you have to submit designs first before you get permission to build anything. Well here, uh, it was a different story. I had to be able to finish the building in order to submit the plans and the design. Well, my skills just came naturally and intuitively. I didn't study, I, I think I only did fourth year woodwork in high school. And yes, I did build the majority of this structure and what we see here, but at any time that I needed help, there was always somebody arriving to give me a hand, to carry timber, to hold a window, to help here and there. So I built it, but with the help of many friends coming and going. It's still just me, it's a work in progress. So it's me building the Rainbow Temple, the full name, the Rainbow Temple of whatever, that's its name, because it's whatever the truth is, this temple is, is designed to incorporate that truth. So it's not about me being a guru or anything, it's about all of us being comfortable with each other, sharing our talents, our individuality, our uniqueness. With all of this oneness, there is a great uniqueness that we all have with ourselves to share, and, and so, it was a place, a meeting place, where people could come and meet, relax, be themselves, cook good food, share good music, and eventually create some really good theatre and performance in order to carry storytelling through to the children of the future. The temple is a community centre, and as and and that's how it's delegated with the with the council. And although maybe the council sees it as a community centre just for our property, no, it's a community centre as community centres are all over the world. A place that can receive guests and travellers, and provide shelter for those in need. A few come. I do not advertise. They come to visit because, by word of mouth, they've heard about it. I was a product of the 60s and the 70s and so were many others and there were great days. We had a great sense of freedom and discovery. So a lot of us did travel the world and have amazing adventures and then return to this magnificent country, to this dream time, the land of the Aboriginal people who've been nurturing it and looking after it for so many, many, many thousands of years. So fortunately for me in, in my journey, I've also connected with the people of this country in a very strong way. and. Uh, 
and I consider what I'm doing here is part of the dreaming. But the dreaming of the day is universal. And most people, when they arrive, generally make some sort of statement about, wow, I feel at home for the first time, or I feel so much at home here, this is amazing, which is great. So I take a lot of pleasure in creating a place where many, many, many people feel at home. Wherever you are on the planet, you have neighbors. And, uh, you know, they say, in the Bible they say, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, my neighbor has been my biggest obstacle. He's, he's been in, in, in the opposite of everything that I've intended to do. And I invited him into the dream. So the universe set that one up. My biggest obstacle is my immediate neighbor and, and, and learning to overcome the emotional realities of loving people that you've lost all respect for. There's been many challenges through the years, uh, but I've overcome them and I will continue to overcome them because I believe the work that I'm doing isn't a personal work. I'm actually doing the work of the universe, of the great spirit, and I'm, like many artists, believe that I'm just the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the brush. I'm merely the paint at the end of the brush, I guess. But, um, but we are at a great time of change, and the temple is built to be a platform where that change can actually happen. It's quite anarchic in that sense of people taking personal responsibility for their lives and for the lives of others around them and for the environment that's around them, the plants and the animals and, and all those things. So there was quite a, um, if you like, a, a sense of interconnectedness that, that people were working with in doing that. This phenomenon of these owner-built, handmade houses that have been such uh, a recognised part of this region. What's really interesting about them, they're great in themselves, but they also point to this broader ecology of people, uh, ideas, materials, tools, techniques, institutions that produce something very special, very radical, very unique, um, an ecology of the not quite square. <laughs>